Hi, I'm Bob Sversel. I'm going to be your ride leader for this history ride around Northeast Seattle. I'm going to take you to some interesting places while telling stories of the people that have lived here and their lasting impacts on the city. This ride has 18 stops around Northeast Seattle. You can download the route map using a link in the video description. We start at Woodland Park. This park and adjacent zoo make up the 179 acre former estate of Guy Carlton Finney, a Scottish lumber mill owner and real estate developer who lived here in the late 19th century. His Woodland Park was a private park with a small zoo that allowed visitors. When he died in 1893, the Seattle City Council purchased it in 1899. In 1902, Seattle hired the Olmsted Brothers firm to design its park system. They also designed park systems for other cities, including Portland, Atlanta, and Boston, and their father co-designed New York City's Central Park. Woodland Park was the site of one of President Warren G. Harding's final speeches. On July 27, 1923, he gave a speech at a Boy Scout jamboree. He died six days later in San Francisco. A memorial was erected in 1925, but it was later broken down into pieces and reused for the construction of the African Savannah exhibit in Woodland Park Zoo by 1980. Our next stop is the former Aqua Theater at Green Lake. The lake was originally called Duitlush by the Duwamish, and it was named Green Lake by surveyor David Phillips in 1855 because it sometimes has green algae blooms. In 1911, as part of the Olmsted Brothers' plan, Green Lake was lowered by seven feet to create more parkland some of the nearby roads follow the old edge of the lake. The Green Lake Aqua Theater was built in 1950 to showcase the Aqua Follies and their swim musicals, featuring Aqua Ballet, stage dancing, and comedy. The stage featured a pair of 40-foot diving towers, and the theater seated around 5,600. Some performers here included Bob Hope, Led Zeppelin, and Grateful Dead. In 1970, the theater was dismantled. The stage was taken down, but some of the grandstand remains. Next to the Green Lake Community Center is a distinctive arch. This is from the Martha Washington School for Girls, which was located near Seward Park along Lake Washington. The school was built in 1921 for girls who were wards of the state, and it taught homemaking skills like childcare, laundry, and cooking. It closed in 1957, and the building was later demolished in 1989. This arch was preserved and placed into storage until 2009, when it was brought here as part of the Green Lake Shade Plaza and Garden Project. Our next stop is in an unlikely place. Mostly hidden from view, we're now in front of a nuclear fallout shelter lying beneath Interstate 5. This was designed in 1961 by Seattle engineering firm Anderson Bjornstad Kane and built in 1963 during the Cold War. It is the only community fallout shelter to be built under a freeway, though others were planned. The fallout shelter had 15-inch thick concrete walls, a central circular area almost 60 feet in diameter, and could support 200 people living inside for two weeks. It was used as a Washington State Department of Licensing office where people could renew their driver's licenses. 
It's now used by the Washington State Department of Transportation to store files and furniture. Riding on Ravenna Boulevard, you might not realize we're riding alongside a former creek bed. Ravenna Creek used to flow from Green Lake along here on its way to Union Bay, part of Lake Washington. When Green Lake was lowered in 1911, Ravenna Creek dried up as far as Cohen Park. After efforts by community members and the Ravenna Creek Alliance, from 1993 through 2006, parts of Ravenna Creek have been daylighted, that is, brought back to the surface, and Ravenna Creek again flows into Union Bay via the University Slough. Off to the side of 28th Avenue is our next stop. Wedgwood Rock is a glacial erratic, a glacially deposited rock that has a different composition from the area around it. It has a similar composition to Mount Erie about 55 miles, 89 kilometers, away, and is believed to have been carried here 14,000 years ago by the Cordilleran Ice Sheet that covered much of the Pacific Northwest. It was used by local indigenous people as a landmark in the dense forest and was at a crossroads for various trails. While it looks enticing for climbers, there is a city ordinance passed in October 1970 prohibiting anyone from climbing Wedgwood Rock with a fine of $100. We're here at the Picardo Farm Pea Patch, the origin of the Pea Patch Community Garden Program. It starts with three Picardo brothers named Ernesto, Oraggio, and Sabino, who emigrated from Salza Urpina in southern Italy to Seattle in the 1890s. They operated a farm in the South Park area until 1922, when they swapped land for a 20-acre plot in northeast Seattle that was part of an area called the Ravenna Swamp. The Picardos operated what is known as a truck farm or market garden. Although they transported their goods daily to places like Pike Place Market in a truck, the term truck farm actually comes from the French word troquet, meaning barter or exchange. The Picardo farm operated until 1962 to 1963. In 1970, a University of Washington student named Darlin Runberg Del Boca wanted to teach local school kids how to grow food, including vegetables for neighbors in need, a predecessor to food banks. She got permission to use part of the Picardo farm, and the land was leased with the help of city councilman Bruce Chipman. In 1973, Seattle purchased the Picardo farm, and in 1974, it authorized the community garden program known as the Pea Patch Program. Today, there are over 80 pea patches around Seattle, and you should remember that the P in Pea Patch stands for Picardo. Matthews Beach Park is a good place for a rest stop as it has public restrooms and water fountains. It is named for John G. Matthews, a homesteader in the 1880s whose estate was turned into this park. Before that, this area was the site of a village for a Hachuapsh tribe known as the Tuoba Dobsh. They had a longhouse near the mouth of Thornton Creek 
and tended a large cranberry bog in the Northgate area. The Burke Gilman Trail is Seattle's most popular rail trail, with thousands of trips occurring on it every week. Let's find out how it came to be. After Northern Pacific Railroad chose Tacoma instead of Seattle for its western terminus, a group of investors including Judge Thomas Burke, Daniel Gilman, and 10 others got together in 1885 and founded the Seattle, Lakeshore, and Eastern Railroad. It ran from Columbia Street in downtown Seattle around the north end of Lake Washington to Gilman, now known as Issaquah, with other lines heading towards Spokane and Canada. The railroad was taken over by Northern Pacific in 1901 and saw heavy operation until 1963. In April 1971, Burlington Northern Railroad announced its intent to abandon its tracks in the greater Seattle area Seeing this opportunity, Merrill Hill and a neighborhood group called the Burke Gilman Trail Park Committee worked with Mayor Wes Ullman and organized a hike in to bring attention to their movement. On September 12, 1971, groups of people hiked on the tracks from both the north and south, converging in a rally at Matthews Beach Park that had about 2,000 attendees. Their efforts were successful and in 1978, a 12.1-mile section of the trail opened from Gasworks Park to Tracy Owens Station, now known as Logboom Park. The Burke Gilman Trail is now a 27-mile long trail. We're now at Magnuson Park, Seattle's second largest park at 350 acres. Previously, it was built in 1922 by the U.S. Navy as Naval Air Station Seattle at Sand Point. The base was deactivated in 1970, and the land was split between Seattle and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in 1975. It's named for U.S. Senator Warren Magnuson, a former naval officer. One of the former naval buildings is an old torpedo shop now used by Cascade Bicycle Club as its headquarters. Cascade Bicycle Club was formed in 1970 by brothers Mike and Rick Kwong who wanted a bicycle club that did more than just organize recreational rides. Today, Cascade Bicycle Club is the largest statewide bicycle organization in North America with over 17,000 members, 1,000 volunteers, including myself, and around 40 staff. The playground in Magnuson Park features a miniature airstrip alluding to the legacy of Sandpoint Flying Field that used to be here. That legacy includes being the start of the first aerial circumnavigation of the world. Eight Army servicemen were chosen to fly four Douglas World Cruiser biplanes given the names Seattle, Chicago, Boston, and New Orleans. On April 6, 1924, they took off from Lake Washington and started their journey. The Seattle crashed in Alaska, and the servicemen were stranded for 10 days before being rescued. The Chicago was forced to land for repairs in Da Nang, part of current day Vietnam. The crew arrived in Paris, France on Bastille Day. The 
Boston went down over the Atlantic Ocean, and the plane sank before it could be recovered. In Nova Scotia, the crew of the Boston rejoined the journey, using a prototype Douglas World Cruiser, which they called the Boston II. On their route across the United States, they stopped in Washington, D.C. and met President Calvin Coolidge. On September 28, 1924, the planes completed their journey around the world as they landed back in Seattle. Their journey was 27,553 miles long and took 175 days. At the 74th Street entrance to Magnuson Park is the World Flight Monument commemorating this accomplishment. As we pass through Magnuson Park, we encounter these mounds. They were ammo bunkers used to store high explosives and magazines for warplanes. The blast mound is there to protect it from explosions. Our next stop is Union Bay Marsh. The area around Union Bay Marsh and University Village has changed dramatically since the 19th century. Union Bay, part of Lake Washington, used to have marshes that extended north through here. You can see on the map how the Seattle, Lakeshore, and Eastern Railroad, now the Burke Gilman Trail, followed the northern edge of these marshes. In 1916, when Lake Washington was lowered, the marshes dried up. For the next 40 years, the area was used as a dump with various names such as the Montlake Landfill. A notable resident of the Montlake Landfill was the fictional character J.P. Patches, host of a popular local children's television show that ran from 1958 to 1981. The University Village Shopping Center was built in 1956, and the Montlake Landfill was closed in 1966. Since then, there have been ongoing restoration efforts to bring Union Bay Marsh back to a more natural state, such as through the Center for Urban Horticulture. Today, the area is called the Union Bay Natural Area and is home to more than 150 species of birds and other wildlife. The only remnants from the original building that housed what would become the University of Washington lie here in the Sylvan Theater. In 1861, before Washington became a state, and while Seattle had a population of only 250, the Territorial University of Washington opened. Its location was considered on the outskirts of town, though it may be hard to believe, in the area between 4th and 6th Avenues and Union and Seneca streets. It became the University of Washington when Washington became a state in 1889, and it had a student body of about 300. In 1895, the University of Washington moved to its current location off Union Bay. Since then, the University of Washington has grown immensely and now has over 47,000 students. The original Territorial University building was torn down in 1908, but the columns were salvaged and moved to the Sylvan Grove Theater. The columns are made of cedar and named Loyalty, Industry, Faith, and Efficiency. The Fairmont Olympic Hotel in downtown Seattle, on University Street, stands on the site of the original university and features a plaque commemorating its founding. Our 
next stop takes us to Drumheller Fountain, a remnant from Seattle's first World's Fair. During the Klondike Gold Rush of 1897, 100,000 people moved to the Yukon, and Seattle served as an important outfitting point for the miners. Inspired by this, Organizers in Seattle made plans to hold a World's Fair promoting the Pacific Northwest, and they chose the University of Washington campus for the site. The organizers hired the Olmsted Brothers firm to design the layout for the expo. The design is centered around Drumheller Fountain, originally called the Arctic Circle, and its main access is oriented towards Mount Rainier. The layout of the University of Washington is still influenced by this design. The Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition was held in 1909 from June 1st to October 16th. It featured buildings and exhibits for industries like forestry, fishing, agriculture, mining, and manufacturing, and for regions all over the North Pacific. Along the west side of the expo was the Pay Streak a long chain of miniature villages with shops, amusements, and exotic attractions representing different cultures, often in grossly inaccurate ways. Notable people at the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition include Zenora Moore and Bertram Philander Ross Hendricks, grandparents of legendary musician Jimi Hendrix. Nora and Ross were part of the Great Dixieland Spectacle, a traveling vaudeville troupe that performed at the expo, and they married in Seattle before eventually moving to Vancouver. This is Architecture Hall, one of the original buildings constructed for the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. It was called the Fine Arts Palace during the expo and hosted art exhibits. One of the only expo buildings that was designed to be permanent, it's been used to house the departments of pharmacy, chemistry, physiology, and currently the Department of Architecture. Cunningham Hall is another original building constructed for the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. It was used as the Washington State Women's Building during the Expo to showcase women's art and provide hospitality for visiting women. The building is named for Imogen Cunningham, a UW graduate who is a pioneering artistic portrait photographer. Another notable UW alum is Jeanette Ranglin who first became involved in the women's suffrage movement at this building. She ran for office in Montana in 1916 and became the first woman to serve in the United States Congress, winning again in 1940. Jeanette was one of the founding members of the Committee on Woman Suffrage, and she was the only member of Congress to vote against the United States joining both World War I and World War II. Standing under the Ship Canal Bridge, we are at the site of its predecessor, the first bridge connecting northeast Seattle with downtown. The Latona Bridge was constructed in 1891 for a streetcar line operated by the Rainier Power and Railway Company. The streetcar ran from downtown Seattle across the bridge to Latona and eventually was extended to Ravenna. The Latona Bridge had a second rail-only span added in 1902. During the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition in 1909, four million people crossed the Latona Bridge to get between the Expo and downtown. Before the Lake Washington Ship Canal opened in 1917, the Latona Bridge had to be converted to a drawbridge to allow ships to pass, but it had an interesting way of doing so. 
One span swung horizontally to open, but the other opened vertically. The Latona Bridge was eventually replaced when the University Bridge opened to traffic in July 1919. As we make our way back to the start, I want to make sure you learn something, so we're having a pop quiz. You can pause the video if you need more time to think of your answers. Question 1. What does the P in P patch stand for? The answer is Picardo. Question 2. What event first influenced the layout of the University of Washington campus? The answer is the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. Question 3. What are the only remaining physical pieces of the Territorial University of Washington's original building? The answer is columns. If you answered everything correctly, awesome job! If you missed any answers, you should probably rewatch the video. We arrive back at the start in Woodland Park. Thank you for joining me on this virtual history ride around Northeast Seattle. There's a lot more history to learn, so go and visit museums, read more on your own, and talk to people. I'll see you on the next ride.